Good morning and hello, everybody. My name is Matteo Patrone. I'm the managing director of the BRD for the Eastern Europe and Caucasus region. And uh, I will welcome to the second part of this event today. And uh, thanks very much to Odile, Beata, Timothy, and Torbjorn for a very insightful discussion in the second, in the first part. I think we, 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 we received a lot of food for thought that we, we, we can build upon also in our panel. Uh, the focus of the second panel is indeed on investment in the real economy and, uh, and the role of the BRD. And as we have heard from uh, uh, the panelists in, in the first discussion, supporting the real economy indeed requires collective action, collective coordination, collective efforts. And we will discuss this with uh, our colleagues, uh, Oleg Gustenko, uh, economic advisor to President Zelensky, Oleksandr Kubrakov, Deputy Prime Minister for Restoration, uh, Volodymyr Kudryski, CEO of Ukrenergo, the power the transmission system operator in Ukraine, Oleksiy Chernyshov, the CEO of Naftogaz, and of course, our Alain Pilou, Vice President Banking at the BRD. Before we start, let me give you some housekeeping uh, tips. Uh, this event uh, is uh, streamed live in uh, Facebook, on Facebook, on uh, on uh, our website, brd.com, and on LinkedIn. And if you want to ask questions, please uh, use the comment uh, below uh, the, the video and, uh, and our staff will pick up those questions. But let me let me now start with, uh, with the first question to Oleg. Oleg you may want to give us a snapshot of what is uh, you see as urgent priorities in the real economy indeed and i would probably focus on the private sector as we will discuss uh, infrastructural issues uh, both in transport and in uh, in energy with uh, with the other panelists Oleg, over to you thank you very much thank you very much to share uh, for this opportunity uh, to share our view uh, today uh, from Kiev. Uh, so basically, uh, never before, never before, Ukraine experienced such a huge decline uh, in our GDP. Never before we were expecting 45% decrease as we are expecting now. Uh, definitely, it's a, a huge decline and uh, really nothing uh, can compensate us at this stage uh, in terms of uh, that kind of decline. Naturally, that we are experiencing significant prog uh, problems on all directions, including the budget one, the fiscal one. Uh, when 50% uh, of your uh, businesses either are not working or not working in a full capacity or uh, working just a, a several hours a day or several uh, days a week, uh, when you have millions of people who left the country or uh, millions of people who are internally removed in the country, within the country, uh, definitely you should experience also a problem uh, with uh, budget revenues. And this is what we are experiencing. That's why we have this fiscal deficit this year on a monthly basis between three to five uh, billion US dollars instead of having 7 uh, billion US dollars as it was expected at the beginning of this year when we were uh, working on a budget for this year. And uh, naturally, uh, we uh, undertook all needed actions in order to make sure that uh, this uh, budget deficit is under control. And naturally, that our allies are working with us uh, in terms of uh, funding that kind of uh, budget deficit. Naturally, that our uh, after all these attacks we are experiencing uh, in our country, naturally, uh, that uh, uh, there is a significant, significant problems uh, in uh, many directions, including the mm, uh, real economy. Uh, look, Ukraine is export-oriented economy. Uh, as you uh, remember, 40% of our uh, Forty percent of our economy is coming from our uh, export. Uh, and what are the main items in our export? Uh, metallurgical sector, uh, agro sector, 
uh, all of those were either destroyed or blocked at some points, almost, uh, almost, uh, you know, were close to zero uh, when the logistic corridors we were not able to use. Uh, when uh, uh, some of our uh, industrial enterprises uh, were already destroyed, uh, when we have number of mines uh, on our uh, on our land, and agro sector is a, you know, in, an important one of the most important uh, sector in our real economy. Obviously, uh, it, uh, it, you know, it drives us uh, uh, to the view in terms of how we can survive now and what are we going to do uh, next uh, in a post-war uh, period. And obviously, uh, it, everything would be next to impossible if, not, uh, if our allies uh, are not given us uh, a helping hand. This is what everybody did, including actually uh, EBRD, and that's why we are extremely grateful for that. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, it uh, comes us uh, uh, to the next issue. How, uh, so, so basically, I would say that the agenda is, uh, I would say, is divided by uh, two uh, uh, two time horizons. The first one is a short term horizon, and the second one is the uh, long term horizon. Uh, the economy is destroyed. Uh, the overall price tag for our economy now uh, direct damage uh, on the level of around 700 uh, billion US dollars. Uh, if you include the indirect cost, the, the, uh, then the price tag might be as high as uh, 1 trillion US dollars. It's not fixed. It's increasing all the time. With all these new attacks, it's increasing, increasing, and increasing. Uh, however, it, it doesn't mean that uh, we don't know how to deal with these huge challenges we are facing now. In terms of the short-term challenges, obviously everything is uh, related to normalizing the life uh, of our people, meaning that also we have to normalize the life of our uh, our economy, of our uh, real sector. For that point of view, uh, everything related uh, to ensuring uh, ensuring uh, normal work of uh, logistic corridors is crucially important. And, nor and uh, logistic corridors and infrastructure would not be uh, would not be operationable if we don't have enough. Uh, finance enough funds in our hands in order to do, in order to make sure that we are moving forward agenda in this direction. And uh, from this point of view, uh, all, all all the actions uh, related to so-called fast recovery, uh, the fast, uh, fast track recovery of our economy is extremely important. And our you know uh, very. Uh, first estimates are shown that we are talking uh, about uh, amount of money on on a level of around uh, 20 uh, billion US dollars. This is the urgent need uh, to uh, to make sure that our economy is uh, continue to be operational. However, in the long run, uh, the challenges are again are huge. But at the same time, in some sense, it's a little bit easy uh, to talk because, uh, you know, on, on one uh, side, it's a little bit uh, far away from now. But at the same time, uh, we already have a consensus in terms of how we are moving forward that agenda. Of course, when we are talking about the future development of Ukraine, uh, someone has uh, to think in terms of what kind of uh, what kind of uh, goals you would like uh, to reach? And definitely, the, everything is related to economic growth. And economic growth uh, uh, should be on a really very high level. I would argue that the level of economic growth we should expect uh, uh, in a post-war period uh, should be on a level of at least 15%. In this in this case, we will be able to recover our economy within the next two years after the war uh, is stopped. Which means that the program uh, should be really 
very well designed and very, I would say, thoughtful, how we can stimulate economic growth in the country. Definitely, uh, everything related to investment climate. Of course, you know, uh, someone can argue that uh, budget, fiscal side, and monetary policy uh, are crucially important, and I would agree with that, but I would say that probably much more important in this sense, and especially in a post-war period time, is everything related to investment climate. And when we are talking about investment climate, we definitely see the role here for all, all international institutions, all international financial institutions, including EPRT. So everything what we were working and discussing before related to investment climate and improving the quality of investment climate in the country, making sure that the investments are coming into the country. Our, uh, our analysis, which we did in the office of the president, showed that each extra, even before the uh, war, each extra one, uh, billion, one billion US dollars in our economy might increase the natural level of economic growth in the country uh, up to uh, 0.5 percentage points, meaning that if you are uh, insuring, let's say, 20% uh, to 20 billion uh, investments to the country, you can uh, easily get extra uh, e extra economic uh, growth on a level of, let's say, uh, 10 percentage points to the natural economic growth. But for that, you have to make sure that the investment climate is on the right uh, is on the right uh, level is on the right quality, meaning that you have enough uh, property rights protection, meaning that uh, you already uh, working hard on a, a judicial system reform, meaning that you are able uh, to decrease administrative barriers for doing business. So meaning all that things which are related to the quality of investment climate in the country. However, uh, it's also true that uh, even in the post-war period, when you have a neighbor uh, like uh, we have now, I mean, uh, Russian Federation, and even when we are talking about post-war period and even when we are talking about current situation, someone has to think in terms of what should be done not only in the direction of improving investment climate in the country, but also what kind of guarantees we can give to investors, uh, local and international, who are coming to the country, who are investing in this country. And those are related to war insurance. And I think that this is also a very important issue, which has to be, uh, which has to be uh, very carefully reviewed and worked out uh, by all IFIs. Uh, including EPRD. I think that here um, EPRD has uh, enough capacity, enough capacity to lead uh, the process uh, from the European side. Uh, so basically, I would say, I, I, let me stop here and then we can... Uh, yeah, thank you very much. You made a number of very important points, in particular one, the one on investment climate. I think we will, uh, we will pick up on that one. And, uh, and as you know, uh, it, it is a, a topic very close to our heart as being an investor in the private sector and, and, and a promoter of reforms in the country partnership with, uh, with the authorities. I, I would give the floor now to Volodymyr uh, because he has to go uh, before the panel ends. Uh, he has a meeting uh, with President Zelensky. Um, Volodymyr, I think your team at Ukrainergo is... Uh, epitomizes really what the entire world is witnessing and seeing in the Ukrainian people in terms of resilience, focus, stamina, composure. And um, I think you're really giving a lesson to, to the entire world. And uh, I would like to hear from you uh, a description of what the situation is these days, uh, even with the latest attacks this week. Thank you very much, Matteo. Hello, dear colleagues. First of all, thank you very much for this uh, warm words. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, uh, they are uh, uh, more uh, relevant for the uh, maintenance and repair teams of Okoronergo that are working currently in, on, in, in field to restore 
electricity after the latest attack and also to our dispatchers that are maintaining a power grid uh, integrated and connected to EU. So we already survived eight massive uh, missile attacks and these attacks represent the biggest, uh, the biggest hit on electric grid that humanity has ever witnessed. Uh, more than 1,000 uh, 1, uh, kamikaze drones and heavy missiles were launched at uh, electric objects all around Ukraine, including uh, Ukrainergo substations as, as, and uh, power plants as primary objects. And unfortunately, these uh, attacks, uh, which were also followed by smaller ones, uh, during uh, these uh, two months, uh, they inflicted a lot of damage uh, to Ukrainian power system. Uh, specifically now, we are experiencing a quite a big deficit of generation capabilities in the grid, because uh, despite the fact that uh, we lost uh, around uh, 25 to 30 percent of consumption, if you compare to the times before the invasion, however, the our losses in generation capacity is uh, which is unavailable temporarily uh, is uh, are much bigger and uh, therefore we have uh, deficit in the system and quite severe power cuts uh, these power cuts are larger after the massive attacks in the first three four days as the system restores as the generation plants restore their ability to produce electricity but, it, but even after this restoration, unfortunately, we will not be able to fully meet the consumption needs in, in Ukraine. Therefore, uh, as an operator of the system, we have to introduce rolling power cuts. The goal is to make them planned, is to make them uh, as predictable as possible. These uh, power cuts, they depress not only consumption of the households, but also, uh, of course, they depress businesses because businesses uh, are part of the time cut off from the grid. And if you uh, look at the statistics of consumption for uh, large industrial uh, plants located in uh, big industrial regions uh, in the east and the center of Ukraine, you would see that uh, their consumption went down quite dramatically uh, because sometimes system power system cannot meet even the minimum demand for electricity that they have to maintain core critical technological processes. So they sometimes have to stop for some time uh, to uh, as they are not able to operate uh, in a normal way. Um, we, uh, of course, uh, understand that these attacks might, might continue. So uh, our goal is to keep the system integrated during this winter. We also have uh, a game plan for this winter, how we can survive and how we can make sure that the system would not collapse. Uh, one uh, important critical element of this plan is to, uh, to to bring to Ukraine uh, equipment which is needed to continue restoration of the grid. Uh, during this uh, months, uh, two months, we uh, uh, explored uh, or find out, uh, found out that uh, there is no big stock of electric, of complicated electric equipment in the world. This fact we already knew before, but uh, uh, it uh, was uh, even clearer for us as we were looking for different types of equipment all around the world and we see that some supplies are ongoing but we need uh, more and we are looking for uh, different types of equipment all around the world uh, in uh, every continent uh, and we are talking to hundreds of companies all around the world to uh, to try to bring something uh, available for use to Ukraine as soon as possible. But this process, of course, uh, also needs some financing. And uh, in that context, the support which is granted, uh, financial support which is given to us by EBRD is absolutely critical. We look forward to, uh, to finalize a new transaction with the bank uh, very soon. And this transaction would strengthen our ability to purchase equipment for the power grid to maintain its operation during this winter. And uh, this is uh, absolute, an absolute must that uh, we have liquidity to perform the core functions of the system operator, which is dispatching of the system, 
meeting our uh, market and industry uh, obligations as an operator and of course uh, purchasing equipment to be able to replace the damaged one. This is one element of the strategy. Uh, second important element would be to uh, finalize negotiations with, uh, with our partners and allies and uh, to uh, set up a mechanism, financial mechanism, to allow import of electricity from EU to Ukraine. We have to benefit from the fact that uh, we are connected to European grid. Now we are benefiting in the form of bigger stability and reliability of the system operation. However, uh, we should not forget that the commercial import from Ukraine is also possible. Uh, from, sorry, from EU to Ukraine is also possible. And uh, we have to use this instrument to, uh, to bring uh, some partial relief to our consumers that are disconnected from the grid quite often. So uh, we can decrease our deficit potentially by bringing imports, but because of price spread between uh, between European and Ukrainian electricity price, uh, we need uh, to design a uh, special uh, special mechanism to finance these imports. As now, there are no commercial operator who would be willing to buy at European price and sell here in Ukraine at Ukrainian price. Um, but uh, the main fact, the main um, message that I would like to send today is that uh, despite these vicious attacks and despite uh, our expectations that these attacks would continue, the system is still running. Yes, we have deficits. Yes, these rolling power cuts are very uncomfortable for citizens and also for businesses. However, the, the main goal is to keep system running. The main goal is to make sure that critical infrastructure is powered, that uh, heating water supply systems, mobile connection, internet are working in the country. And the uh, system is integrated, it's, it hasn't fallen apart, and it is connected to you. These are currently the main strategic goals uh, to, uh, to pass this winter and, of course, to wait for uh, the Ukrainian, heroic Ukrainian uh, military forces to gain victory for the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vladimir. If you can stay a few minutes more, but we, are, we fully understand if, if, when you need to go, you just go. Let me let me move now to to Oleksiy Chernyshov, the CEO of uh, Naftogaz, because he is also uh, someone uh, in the office of President Zelensky later on. So I think we want to hear from him his first the, the experience as, as new CEO of Naftogaz in in our. In our first uh, uh, meeting, uh, Oleksiy told me, I need to reestablish the trust in the company. I think that statement per se is a, is a, is a decisive step in the right direction. But uh, uh, as, as you know, we are partnering with Naftogaz, Odile mentioned that uh, in providing a package of 500 million uh, euros for the supply of gas, there is quite a lot to be done in the company. Uh, Oleksiy, give us your first impressions as, as the new CEO of the company and the immediate needs that you are facing. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. And uh, hello, Mateo. Great to see you again. Uh, EBRD uh, is a great friend of Ukraine and has been a really strategic partner for Ukrainian energy system. And uh, let's call it an energy partner, as well as for the country and after gas uh, in particular. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank for your support uh, and the advocacy efforts uh, and uh, the discussion today actually proves uh, your ability to perform. And uh, with working with EBRD, we clearly know that uh, the funds will be provided and distributed efficiently and transparently. That is very important for Ukraine. Uh, in particular, I would like to thank EBRD for the providing uh, a, a loan of 300 million in June and another one, which is uh, uh, earlier allocated by the government of Norway, 200 million that we are expecting to receive uh, in the nearest future. So coming back to your uh, question, Matteo, you're right. Uh, the restoration of trust on after gas uh, is my key priority. 
and uh, this actually is aligned in the fields of uh, uh, first of all transparency and supervisory board uh, uh, relaunching that is planned uh, to be established uh, by the end of uh, january uh, 2023 the process have been restarted already number two uh, we should uh, uh, come out of the default and have the consent solicitation with our eurobond holders and number three of course uh, this is the security and stability within the winter and uh, heating season and uh, with my message, I would like uh, to stop on the third one. The third priority, I think, is the main one and so the main challenge, obviously. The winter and the war is the main challenge for the energy system in general, NAFTA gas in particular. So we have started the heating season. Uh, we expect it to be the hardest ever. And our task is to provide security and to actually warm up every Ukrainian and provide gas to every household and every business unit that requires it during the winter. Regarding the damages, uh, the damages are obvious. Uh, we all understand that uh, the energy is uh, another weapon. And I would say that uh, uh, this kind of weapon is, uh, might be even equal to the military type of the, of the, of the weapon, and we should uh, consider it seriously. And uh, we are, we've been seriously attacked by Russian missiles and uh, some part of our infrastructure and gas production infrastructure has been hit. We've been, we had an attack on 350 facilities of NAFTA gas. Just imagine that the pipeline of gas, uh, 450 kilometers, is damaged and we should uh, fix it as well. And... Uh, there is a certain loss also in gas production over the course of this winter already. We would estimate that uh, the production loss uh, in gas is calculated, is valued uh, somewhere around $700 million. That is the volume that we were not able to produce due to the damages in our equipment. Uh, that causes, of course, additional uh, complexity and additional demand for the import of uh, gas uh, from other countries that we are now actively concentrated. And I would like to thank again for your support. Uh, we have been actively working with the appropriate loans dedicated for gas import. And this will be done already by the end of December. We plan to uh, sign uh, the appropriate volumes. Nevertheless, those volumes uh, will not be enough uh, to go through the winter and we will have to import more. Another thing which uh, uh, complicates the situation, and I'm coming back to Volodymyr's uh, presentations uh, uh, earlier, uh, we all understand that the energy segment and electrical grid uh, has obvious complications, and this causes additional demand of uh, production of electricity with uh, the use of uh, natural gas. So practically we are facing the situation when we will have to produce more electricity out of natural gas, which was not been originally calculated in our volumes. And this is an additional volume that we should buy. Uh, the ex ex expected uh, volume of additional import is now being uh, estimated at 2.6 uh, billion of cubic meters required for production of electricity. Uh, I'm sure uh, it cannot be the final number uh, due to the situation that military attacks and missile attacks are, being, are continuing and uh, the infrastructure, critical infrastructure has been hit more or less weekly and the situation is changing. Uh, but this is the roundabout number. Uh, that we should uh, take into uh, consideration. Uh, another thing is replacing of the damaged equipment. We are, not, we are now concentrated on that as well. In order to restore uh, the volume of the gas production uh, in Ukraine itself. Uh, we are now moving uh, to restore uh, our uh, production volumes by the end of December. I think we will get back to our original numbers. Uh, that is the plan. Uh, of course, uh, 
it is a little bit premature uh, to state uh, that uh, the heating season uh, is uh, somehow guaranteed with uh, the volumes of natural gas, as long as we should still have to import significant amounts. And the situation with possible risks is also obvious. Uh, but uh, uh, at the way we have organized it right now, and I am as a head of uh, governmental, uh, uh, so to say, governmental uh, committee for the uh, heating season uh, organization, I would like to state that the appropriate amount of gas for the households and for the heating, centralized heating, is uh, well uh, organized. And uh, the main risk that we would foresee is additional volume of gas needed for the uh, electricity production, which is quite uh, significant. Uh, so we stay uh, absolutely uh, can, can, in a continued uh, trust uh, with uh, EBRD. Uh, we stay uh, committed to our values and to the continuation of our cooperation. And it's obvious for us that our future uh, and future heating season is very much uh, uh, dependent to our effective cooperation with EBRD, uh, which we are very much, uh, which we very much appreciate. Uh, thank you. Uh, it is all from my side. Uh, I can confirm that I should partner Volodymyr uh, for the meeting that he has announced. Thank, thank you, thank you very much, Alexey. Thank you very much, Volodymyr, again for for joining us. I, 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 we, we are fully appreciative of the, of the fact that uh, these are incredibly difficult times, and, and and the fact that you spent some time with us is 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 really uh, important. Um, I would move to Alain at the moment, and uh, Alain, you you have the kind words of both Volodymyr and. Uh, and Alexei on uh, on our partnership with Ukrainergo and uh, and and Naftogaz. But how do you see in general the approach of uh, of the international donors and international partners of Ukraine, and in the BRD in particular, and uh, which which are in your view the areas of strength and the areas of weakness that we we should work on? But also, how do you think our approach will evolve over time? We 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 have discussed already in the first panel. Uh, the the issue of the grant intention, but there is also a need of uh, absorption capacity uh, that we should uh, consider. Well, thank you, uh, Matteo, and uh, and hello, uh, friends from uh, Tokyo, where I'm trying to convince uh, both the Japanese government and uh, Japanese companies to step up their support to uh, to Ukraine. Uh, First of all, I'm so happy to see you uh, on screen, uh, friends from and partners from Ukraine. And I would like in one word to express to you my admiration for what you achieve uh, in the midst of uh, extreme circumstances. So, uh, Aliek, uh, Alexandre represented by his uh, deputy, Alexei Volodya, my, my respect to you. Look, we have uh, we have focused, as you know, on the real economy uh, so far, and we hope to inject in Ukraine uh, at least 1.5 billion uh, euros by the end of uh, of this year. Where has this money uh, been going? Uh, it has been mentioned, but maybe uh, not um, uh, completely. Uh, we are supporting trade, import and export uh, by issuing uh, guarantees under our trade facilitation program. And this is very important because uh, it is a lease of life for many uh, private sector companies in the country. We have focused on vital utilities, of course, Naftogaz, of course, Ukrainergo, of course, the Ukrainian railways. We are focusing on the private sector also through loans, through liquidity in the agribusiness sector in priority, but not only. And we act directly or we act via also the Ukrainian uh, banks, which, by the way, have remained open, have remained functional. And this is uh, also uh, admirable. Uh, we are also working, as you know, on the solidarity lanes uh, with the European Commission and others, including by reinforcing, you know, the network in of the Moldovan railways in order to help get, you know, uh, products out of Ukraine and, uh, and, and into Ukraine. We could not have done it alone. 
we got your support, Ukrainian friends, to do that. And we got the support of the international community. I will not repeat it because Odile uh, has said that uh, in, the first, uh, in, in, in the first panel. Uh, however, there is one thing that I want to tell you. We are, in fact, the only institution which is taking risk on its balance sheet. And it is not simple. You know, we, we have a balance sheet and uh, we cannot, uh, of course, use it, you know, uh, to uh, uh, beyond certain limits. But we will continue and we will do whatever it takes uh, to support uh, Ukraine. I want also to say that we have tried to react at speed. We are not the largest of institutions, but because of that, maybe we try to be agile and speed is our obsession. Ukraine has no time. We need to act now. So, for example, after being in Kiev with Odile and Matteo on the 21st of October and seeing Volodya, we put in motion a new 300 million euro loan to Ukrainergo for urgent repairs and liquidity purposes as well. And the Netherlands have added 72 million uh, euro of, of grants. And, and all this is going to get out of the door uh, by the end of the year. And hopefully, Volodya, we can uh, sign that in Paris on the 14th of October. Uh, by the way, we got it approved by our shareholders with massive support. I had never seen such support at EBRD in the uh, in in the 30 years that I have spent you know in the in the institution as I said we are going to continue we will do whatever it takes in order to support Ukraine and certainly we will invest the three billion that we have in mind for 22 and 23 together with other institutions in good cooperation because we hope that others will join our commitment to the real economy and will go beyond uh, uh, budget support. We expect, as was said also in the first panel, that there will be an increase in grants as opposed to loans. And this would be a very good development because there is so much that uh, Ukraine as a country and Ukrainian state-owned companies can, uh, can accommodate. Huh? Uh, so we need uh, grants and the grants will come. There was a question on that in the first panel, which maybe was not entirely answered. The grants will come if the donors are reasonably confident that their money will reach its final destination and will be spent wisely. And this is why Norway, you know, uh, worked through EBRD in order to uh, allocate 200 million euros to uh, Naftogaz. And Alexi reminded that. And this is why the Dutch have worked through us in order to allocate 72 million to Ukrainergo. And so this is. This is good and uh, we need to continue that and we are positioning ourselves as managers of grants for your benefit, uh, uh, friends of, uh, of Ukraine. The last point, uh, because the question was posed already and I want to say a word on that, it's how to mobilize investors you know, in the period ahead. Of course, when the, when, when the war hopefully uh, stops, it would be a mistake to think that investors will come, will rush into Ukraine just because, you know, uh, Ukraine has behaved and is behaving heroically during this war. They will look at what they were looking at before the war. They will look at the rule of law, at the fight against corruption, at the judicial reform, at the investment climate, at the governance. This is what Oliek said in his first intervention, and he is, he is absolutely right. And we will need to work on that together in order to get people into Ukraine. Some of them do not wait. Uh, a Polish company is reopening a large factory in the west of Ukraine, and we are supporting them with liquidity because they know Ukraine and they, they are used to working in Ukraine. So this is very good, but it is only one example. We will need much, much more than that in order to contribute to the revival of the, of the Ukraine economy. We will need also most probably to work together on insurance mechanisms, conflict insurance mechanisms in order to incentivize investors, but also commercial banks to resume their support to, uh, to Ukraine. It's a technical matter, but I just wanted to mention it uh, in, in passing. Thank you, Matteo. Over to you. Thank you very much, Alain. And uh, let me now turn to the Deputy Minister of Infrastructure, who is uh, here representing uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Kubrakov, that uh, has been 
retain in the office of uh, President Zelensky. I think there is a, a crisis management meeting uh, ongoing there. Uh, Yuri, I, I, I'd like to hear from you which are the priorities in uh, in the transport sector and uh, and um, as you know, we've been partnering with Ukrasaliznitsa. We provided 150 million euro of liquidity to them. We are preparing another project for emergency repairs. Um, and, and we are also discussing with Ukraftador uh, the repurposing of part of our package uh, for uh, the, um, con the rehabilitation of a road from Viv towards the Polish border. But what is, what is your assessment of the immediate uh, needs there and and if you can give us also a sense of where you see the sector going in the next 12 months thanks uh, good day dear colleagues dear Matteo. first of all the greetings from Nisa Kubrako from all our team for the constant support from EBRD uh, to the uh, in transport infrastructure of Ukraine as uh, we had it before 24th of February in the field of Ukraine railway, in Ukrainian ports, the road construction, and especially after the start of uh, full-scale uh, war against Ukraine. Unfortunately, today, uh, almost every day, our infrastructure continue to be the target of uh, the enemy. According to the report of the World Bank, the damage caused in the transport sector of Ukraine for, the, for now is almost 30 billion. The losses reach 26 billion, and the need for restoration is 74 billion. In the housing sector, the damage is 39 billion, and the need for restoration and reconstruction is already 69 billion dollars. The municipal services sector of Ukraine was harmed uh, for the amount of more than $2 billion. The need of restoration is about $6 billion. In fact, from the first week of the full-scale invasion, we began to restore the infrastructure that is critically necessary for the defense capability of the state and uh, the mobility of population. For the moment, uh, we already maintains 30, 72 temporary crossing on the roads, about 2,000 kilometers of the roads, more than 1,000 kilometers of a railway, trucks have been restored, and major repairs are also being carried out on 45 damaged bridges. 12 modular towns were opened for internally displaced persons, as well as residents who lost their homes as a result of military aggression. Also, the register of damaged and destroyed property has been developed, which in a single database will be a single database uh, with information on the residential, transport, and social spheres affected by Russian military aggression. It will be used for planning and managing the further reconstruction process. Our goal for now is not only reconstruction of the destroyed property, but also the creation of modern and efficient infrastructure for future. We plan to apply the best global practice of urban development, taking into account the needs of energy efficiency, existing modern supply system, security, and uh, <clears throat> inclusiveness. We have already started the reform processes so that the public, international partners, and experts are confident in the efficiency of spending funds. We see the need to create a one specialized pro platform for the restoration and reconstruction of the territories of Ukraine, so-called like reconstruction coordination platform of Ukraine. Taking this, this opportunity, we hope that uh, our previous experience of cooperation with EBRD can be a, a good step in order to develop it for the future for the uh, after-war needs of Ukraine. I would like to again thank of EBRD and all your team for the constant support, and uh, we think that uh, in the future, uh, EBRD will be the key partner of uh, the future platform for restoration of Ukraine. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Yuri. This was Yuri Vasco, Deputy Minister of Infrastructure, who very kindly stepped in for Deputy Prime Minister Kubrakov, that is still uh, at a meeting with President Zelensky.
Uh, you have a few questions from the audience, but before uh, I go there, I would like to ask a second question to, to Alain, and uh, actually uh, a second and a third one. Um, the, the one is about uh, various proposals that we had uh, from various corners uh, in, uh, in the past months about the creation of uh, a number of platforms from uh, reconstruction, from the Fund for Reconstruction to the Agency for Reconstruction, to even a, a sort of Ukrainian bank for reconstruction of development. What, what's your assessment of these uh, uh, of these proposals? And uh, and the other the other question is um, for both you and and Oleg maybe is um, indeed the, the the needs for immediate uh, reconstruction and repairs are are significant uh, we have 20 billion dollars but there is a question of uh, absorption capacity in uh, in the two years before the conflict i think the absorption uh, capacity of ukraine and, and the execution of the budget amounted to an average of 4.7 billion dollars so how how can we um, make sure that we are not uh, uh, overshooting in terms of uh, of ambition in uh, in uh, in uh, in restarting the reconstruction, and and how can we assure that actually the execution capacity is there? Alain. Oh, thank you, uh, Matteo. It's not an it's not an easy question, but so uh, as your question is difficult, I will I will try to answer relatively simply. You know, the, uh, first of all, there is a uh, uh, there is a, a duty to evaluate the needs, and the needs they evolve every day. You know, the World Bank did uh, a very good work in June uh, to, to uh, assess uh, the, the, uh, the 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 damage and the needs for reconstruction, but it is already outdated by definition, in particular because of the of the more recent uh, Russian attacks. So this is number one. Number two, there is a need to confront the uh, requirements and the funding. And within the funding, there is a need to separate what can be lending and what can be grants. All this is extremely difficult and it requires a lot of order and a lot of consistency. A lot of consistency, first of all, from the Ukrainian side, where it is absolutely crucial, in my view, that there is Ukrainian ownership uh, of the of the process, and within Ukraine, a good coordination between the various uh, um, uh, administrations. Of course, the presidential administration and the government, first of all, in terms of what needs to be created. I think that uh, our Ukrainian friends. Uh, are uh, uh, know exactly where they are going, and it will be their decision. On the international side, the coordination has been slow. And what is needed, in my view, is, first of all, a political level of coordination, which has started to move after Berlin, uh, uh, and but uh, so far, you know, has not been, you know, really completed and uh, and implemented. So this is for the G7, Ukraine, and uh, uh, the EU, you know, to uh, uh, make a decision on that, hopefully by the end of this year. And secondly, and very importantly, there needs to be an operational level of coordination. And for this, as uh, our Ukrainian friends know very well, our uh, suggestion at EBRD is to use the international group that we have been convening since the first days after the Russian aggression and since the end of February, and which includes all international institutions relevant for Ukraine, and now includes Ukraine, includes the US, includes the chair of the G7, Germany, and will most probably include in the next few weeks the other countries of the G7. It has the merit to exist. It has the merit to be recognized by the various parties. And we are in the starting blocks in order to transform it into an operational platform to confront needs and funding. Uh, so this is what I wanted to say, Matteo. Over to you. Thank you very much, Alain. Let me go back to Oleg then and, and, and ask him uh, uh, the, 
again the question on absorption capacity and uh, in, in terms of uh, of uh, of uh, immediate reconstruction but also uh, which uh, priority industries you think the private sector in particular should be focusing on Oli, go over to you thank you Matteo. So, 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 so basically, uh, look, look uh, absolutely understandable that uh, uh, everybody uh, who is now uh, in, uh, in Ukraine and also all our allies are trying uh, to assist us in all possible ways. And of course, the most urgent issues are related to uh, how we can survive right now. So, uh, look, even the horizon of planning now is that what will happen tomorrow, what will happen the day after tomorrow. Of course, we are thinking in terms of what will happen in the nearest future and nearest future, let's say, one month from now. But uh, this is just uh, what I am trying to say, that the uh, perspective for our planning is really very limited now. But it, it doesn't mean that we are not thinking in terms of the overall uh, overall. Uh, plan, if you wish, in terms of rebuilding of the Ukrainian uh, of uh, of Ukraine of the Ukrainian economy in the future in, during the post-war uh, period, and uh, definitely when we are talking about the current needs, uh, current needs to so-called fast-track recovery. So what we are talking about, we are talking obviously about all critical critical parts of our infrastructure, which includes which was already pointed out by. Uh, colleagues, uh, everything related to our electrical uh, infrastructure, everything related to our critical parts uh, of uh, of uh, logistics, because uh, still we have to keep our economy running, meaning that we have to make sure that uh, critical bridges are in place. We, we have to make sure that our uh, population, that our citizens are receiving uh, if I may say, under these conditions, enough services, and at least when we are thinking in terms of the most critical services, of course, we are talking about, you know, heating and water supply, but we are also talking about the uh, possibility to uh, to have access uh, to uh, hospitals, let's say. Uh, again, it's critically important. Uh, so from this point of view, uh, this is all. This is not also. Uh, this is not the story just about the money. This is a story also in terms of how 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 fast uh, how fast we can uh, work in, in that direction. For example, as uh, in, in the case of uh, electricity, we need to have an equipment. We don't have. I mean, you can find as much money as uh, you probably wish, but the problem is that where you are going to buy all this equipment. It's not that easy. So from this point of view, it's also a number of questions and number of tasks uh, the government is trying to decide now. And it's also true that all these tasks, all these goals will not be, uh, uh, you, you cannot decide uh, all, 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 all these issues, with, uh, resolve all these issues uh, without help of our partners, including the DRD. So from this point of view, it's an extremely important to have that kind of joint work. And that's why, actually, when we are talking about long-term prospects uh, for, uh, this is what the writer pointed out by uh, Matteo. Yes, we have different, we have different uh, platforms. Uh, the recovery is discussing here and there, um, you know, different plans. We already heard of, uh, you know, our official uh, presentation, which was done in Berlin by uh, Prime Minister. But it doesn't mean that uh, uh, that we are not able uh, to find, let's say, uh, a common denominator uh, in here. And the common denominator in here is that uh, we all uh, wish uh, to rebuild Ukraine. We all understand that it's just necessary uh, to do as soon as possible. So it has to be, if you wish, overall a fast track recovery for the whole program. It's not like you, we, we have decades uh, for implementing all these plans. And it means that if we are all agree on that, 
it means that the united platform has to be organized. And this united platform meaning that definitely uh, it should be participation of representatives of all our allies, including G7, uh, including international financial institutions, and definitely the leading role uh, should be, uh, in my view, for sure, on the side of uh, Ukraine. This is for sure, and I absolutely agree, and thank you, uh, colleagues, for uh, pointing this out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oleg. I think we all agree on the principles of, uh, of the recovery program that has been set out by the authorities, indeed, in consultation with the, the international partners and, uh, and um, principles of uh, building back better, principles of inclusivity, principles of governance, of uh, green recovery, uh, energy resilience through, through uh, um, diversification of sources of energy and, and, and renewable energy in, in particular. So I think uh, we, we, we all share those principles. I think it's important now to get on with the job, eliminating some of the noise and the distraction around it. And, uh, and that's, uh, that, that is one of the roles that the BRD intends to play. I would like to thank everybody for their participation and uh, in particular those who are dealing with uh, incredible stress and pressure in order to alleviate the damages uh, as a result of the Russian attacks to civilian infrastructure and are now discussing with President Zelensky how to uh, deal with the, the issue. And uh, I'm Matteo Patrone, I'm the Managing Director of the BRD in Eastern Europe and Caucasus. Thanks very much for joining Slavo Ukraini.